The Boondock Saints, a violent cult classic indie film from the mind of Troy Duffy, the protagonist of our tale. His rags to riches stories had taken Hollywood by storm in the late 90s, going from a bouncer at a bar to on track to becoming the next Quentin Tarantino. Aggressive negotiating tactics, arrogance, ego, all being fueled by a steady flow of liquor, Duffy would watch it all disappear. This is the story of a man who was given the golden ticket, burnt every bridge that he had, and still somehow managed to make a film. This is what happened to Boondock Saints. Act 1. Das Wunderkind. In the mid-90s, a Boston-born, regular old blue-collar working boy, Troy Duffy, would move to Hollywood, California to chase his dreams to be a rock and roll icon. It wouldn't be hard for him to get a minor speaking role in a Ben Affleck movie or be slid right in as one of the dock workers on season two of The Wire. Which, I know, it's, it's Baltimore, but I'm just trying to paint like a character portrait of who this man is. Troy wasn't alone in his dreams of being rock star made. In LA, he performed with his band, which was composed of his brother Taylor and his friends Jimmy and Gordon. Collectively, they'd be known as The Brood. No, un unfortunately not that brood. Like most struggling artists, Duffy would also need to find a job to pay the bills and would pick up work as a bouncer at Jay Sloan's Tavern located on Melrose Avenue. Not feeling creatively fulfilled, Duffy used his break time at work to begin writing a script. This script would initially start off as a TV series and would eventually mold its way into a feature film format. This script would become The Boondock Saints. Well, actually, it was originally called Boondock Saints, The Accidental Saints, to which the movie studio was like, yeah, n no, no, that, that actually really sucks. How about, how, about, how about we just like, how about we just cut it in half? I mean, it is just the name of two movies slopped together, which I think is kind of symbolic for the mess that movie is, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Also, it's probably worth noting that I can't actually confirm any of this because my source is facts.net slash movie slash 38 facts about the movie The Boondock Saints. This is literally the only place I could find anyone saying that, but it made me giggle, so uh, I am now declaring it canonically true in the Duffy lore. The script for the Boondock Saints was inspired by crime-infested apartments Duffy was living in at the time. Seeing junkies and drug dealers was a pretty normal occurrence, and there was a specific moment that he cited as his main inspiration. He'd watch a drug dealer take the money off the body of a dead junkie, and Duffy and his brother would fantasize about violently attacking the criminals in his neighborhood, like some kind of Beantown Batman. Oh God. And those violent aspirations would manifest themselves in his newfound love for writing. At the time, and to this day, Duffy didn't know how to write a screenplay. So he got his hands on the script to Jack by Francis Ford Coppola, basically trying to mimic the format as best as possible. After only two weeks of writing, Duffy had completed the script and handed it off to his friend Chris Brinker, aka CB, who at the time was a PA or production assistant at New Line Cinema. In 1997, through the graces of God, CB managed to get the script into the hands of then-president of New Line Cinema, Michael DeLuca. DeLuca instantly fell in love with the Boondock Saints and Duffy's go f yourself Boston attitude and gave him an offer. This would spark interest in then-Miramax president, Harvey Weinstein, which would begin a bidding war between the rival studios. At the time, Miramax and New Line Cinema were the top independent film studios in Hollywood. For context, in the 90s, we'd see a rise in independent filmmakers breaking through into mainstream success. People like Kevin Smith, Robert Rodriguez, to an extent, Paul Thomas Anderson and David Fincher, but the man who wrote the blueprint to overnight indie darling was Quentin Tarantino, whose films can be identified by their gratuitous violence almost to the point of parody. Similarities like these with Duffy and Tarantino would turn him into this mystical wunderkin within the industry, catapulting himself and his movie to the front of the line. Studios, producers, actors, everybody wanted to take a ride on the Duffy Express, the D-Train. In his first meeting with Harvey Weinstein, Harvey would ask him, who do you want to have star in the movie? Duffy replied with a list of candidates, including Jim Carrey, to which Harvey said, you don't go with Miramax with Boondock, you don't give Boondock Saints to Miramax and make a deal with me. 
I'm going to get every actor you just listed in my movies and you won't get a single one. <laughs> Yo, free Harv, man. Harv Conda forever. What's a, what's a couple of salts when you got bars? Despite Harvey Weinstein being the Suge Knight of the movie biz, the Duff Dog would accept an offer he couldn't refuse. This contract was unheard of for a first time untested director. He'd receive a $500,000 paycheck, a $15 million budget to shoot the dang film. Keep in mind this was in 1997, so with an inflation, it would be 955000 and 27.6 million respectively. His band, The Brood, were hired to produce the soundtrack. He'd have final say over all casting decisions and creative control on the final edit of the film. And on top of all of that, he somehow managed to convince Harvey Weinstein to purchase the bar he was bouncing at, Jay Sloan's, so they could co-own it together. Harvey Weinstein effectively took Duffy under his wing. He would be labeled Harvey's next protege, a moniker held by people such as Quentin Tarantino, and a rogues gallery of current Hollywood executives. Duffy would now be given the full red carpet treatment by Hollywood, rubbing shoulders with celebrities left and right, studios and execs playing nice, stroking his ego. His story captured the heart of Americans. He'd be featured on the cover of magazines and sign a deal with William Morris Endeavor, aka WME, which at the time was called William Morris Agency, one of the biggest, if not the biggest management agencies in the world. Even the brood were offered a multi-album deal deal with Maverick Records. That deal would be facilitated by Tony Montana, yes, he's a real person, not, not no relation to the fictional character, and Mark Bryan Smith, who were the co-managers of the band. It's also around this time that Duffy would hire this duo to film a documentary about his rise to becoming the Hollywood golden child, which would release in 2003 called Overnight. But unbeknownst to the Duff Dog, he had effectively hired a film crew to document his demise. Act 2, The Patron Saint of Pride. With his newfound fame, the Duff would take a trip back to Boston to see his family, whereas hubris would be a warning sign of what's to come. You've been there sometimes with me in meetings with some of the biggest guys in this town, Tony. I sit down there, I got drunk the night before, I'm hungover as hell, I'm wearing my overalls, these guys are all in suits. I'm smoking. If our music in this film is embraced, we will have accomplished something that no one else in the history of this film world has ever done be accepted on a huge scale in both mediums of film and music. Once he managed to kick down the door of Hollywood, he fell into the trap of gluttony like so many had before him. He'd be out drinking every night with the boys and the Hollywood elite alike, living that rock star lifestyle, blissfully unaware that the industry was swallowing him whole. Behind the scenes, tensions would begin to build between Duffy and anyone that had the pleasure of working with him. In his mind, Hollywood fell in love with him because he was a tough kid from Boston that wasn't gonna take no shit. At the time, Duffy was too naive to see on paper everyone likes the bad boy, but in practice, Hollywood is filled with out-of-touch liberal elite sociopaths who would view Duffy's overly aggressive negotiating tactics as hard to work with. And if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to hit the like button or else you'll be cursed. And if you don't share this video with 10 of your friends, your crush won't go to the prom with you. There are a few entities he'd actively make enemies out of. Due to the production taking too long, frustrations would start to grow with WME, and he wanted to put rumors out in Hollywood that he was unhappy and was willing to jump ship. Keep in mind this is less than a year since he signed with WME, Miramax, and Maverick, so if you know anything about Hollywood, like these things take a long time to produce. The other entity he mistakenly made enemies with was Miramax themselves, more specifically with young Meryl Poster who at the time was pretty low on the totem pole of Miramax, but would eventually rise to become Weinstein's top guy. What am I gonna do, Hitler's? I'm Hitler's top guy. Regardless of where she'd end up, at the time, Meryl was Harvey's assistant, meaning she would have his ear, and his pretty rotten penis, I guess, and would somewhat be in control of the fate of the film. During casting is where tensions really began to build, and a giant factor in what would label the D-Man as hard to work with. Duffy originally wanted to cast Stephen Dorff and Mark Wahlberg as the twins, but Marky Mark passed on it for Boogie Nights, possibly also partly due to him hearing rumors that Duff was hard to work with. He was also pushing for Brendan Fraser, Nikki Cat, and Ewan McGregor. It seemed like the casting of FBI agent Paul Schmecker would be the most contentious between the two parties, with D-Dog Duff Duff constantly clashing heads with Miramax over his choices. He wanted Kenneth Branagh, they wanted Bill Murray or Mike Myers. 
He countered with Patrick Swayze. They were pushing for Sylvester Stallone, who the studio had a very close relationship with. At some point, Kevin Spacey and Robert De Niro were also in consideration. Duffy's inflated sense of self-worth would lead to many blow-up arguments between him and Miramax. His misreading of his artistic currency also led to him believing that he could fight with the hand that plucked him from the litter, Harvey Weinstein. Pre-production on the film was supposed to begin in Boston in December of 97, but Miramax pulled out of the project, with producer Lloyd Sagan officially stating that the project had stalled because of casting and location problems, aka it's Duffy's fault. With Duffy the body being chosen out of complete obscurity, becoming an overnight auteur sensation, only to be dropped by Hollywood's most respected producers, this would blackball the notorious, overly combative, arrogant, and hard to work with first-time director who has yet to actually direct anything. Like, at all. And they say when it rains, it pours. The Brood were also dropped by Maverick Records. This would cause Duffy to call an emergency meeting with the band. He'd say, quote, The game has just changed, and now we're in an area where we have to produce, or we're done. His complete, utter lack of awareness is, like, exemplified by that statement. He truly believed he was the man, that he was a creative genius, the voice of a generation, without ever having produced a single thing. Hollywood got caught up on the Weinstein-endorsed hype train, and so was conductor Duffy himself. He continued to berate his band about having no more mess-ups, as if no part of the current situation was his fault. His ego would not allow him to see the pattern, the common denominator in all of his failures. Him. Duffy truly believed that Harvey Weinstein had blackballed him. Which on some level I'm sure is true. He took a shot at the king and he missed. But he uses that as an excuse for his failures, when in reality they all started and ended with himself. In 1998, he would attempt to reshop the script around town, and with none of the major studios showing any interest at all, this would only further fuel his theory that this was a coordinated attack against the artistic genius. A small indie studio franchise film offered him a budget of less than half of what Miramax was offering, but seeing this was the only offer that would actually get his film produced, Duffy accepted. The Boondock Saints would go into production with principal filming taking place in Toronto, Canada, and even though Duffy was blackballed, his name did actually still hold weight in Hollywood. I mean, credit where credit is due, Duffy actually did a good job casting the film. Norman Reedus and Sean Patrick Flannery were cast as the Mechanist Twins, the protagonists of the film. Willem Dafoe was cast as FBI Special Agent Paul Schmecker, Billy Connolly as Il Duce, and even a pre-canceled Ron Jeremy made a guest appearance. After filming concluded, Duffy Duffy is seemingly back on the up and up. The Brood signed a new deal with Lava and Atlantic Records, but during this regrouping period, Duffy didn't seem to learn any humility. Tony and Mark, his co-managers and co-directors of the documentary, confronted Duffy about being cut out of money from the record deal. Duffy didn't want to give Tony and Mark their cut, justifying it by saying that it was a gift and not actual payment of services. If you're not aware of how the music industry works, um, generally a manager will collect 15% of the net revenue. This doesn't apply to everything. It'll apply to sales, record deals, publishing deals, etc. This doesn't apply to things like merchandise or touring, though you would would need to pay a tour manager for that, which is something separate. The idea behind this is you give 15% to your manager who takes care of all the things that you don't want to do, the paperwork, the um, uh, you know booking studios, being the liaison between the labels and the lawyers, etc. Just all the messy administrative tasks that pull the artist away from being an artist. Duffy felt like since the label approached him that they didn't deserve their cut. And to be clear, that's not how things work from a legal standpoint. Judging by their conversation on camera, I'm gonna assume that um, this was not like some kind of formal deal with paperwork. This was more of a, uh, of a handshake type deal with out any like real solid terms. So he might have some ground to stand on here, but Tony and Mark were definitely his friends and like with him from the beginning. So in my opinion, it seems kind of scummy to cut them out now that the money's coming in. Act three, fake it till you break it. In early 1999, The Brood began recording their album. During the recording process, Duffy's I do all the work so you don't deserve anything attitude would extend from not only the band's managers, but to the rest of his bandmates as well. In this candid interview, he's talking behind their backs about how the rest of the band's egos are out of control. And they're all like, oh, this is a band, we all did this. Did we all do this? 
I don't think so. The film would debut at Cannes Film Festival in spring of 99 in France. Through a lackluster critical reception, it has now left the movie without any distribution and any way for it to hit theaters. This would be less of an issue in 2024 with the advent of streaming services like Netflix and a DIY mentality being celebrated by fans. But in 1999, a straight to VHS release would be a death nail. The film wouldn't be the only area where Duffy's ego would affect. The brood are also starting to fall apart with the band, mainly Taylor holding a quasi-intervention for Duffy because of the person he had become. His ego had spiraled completely out of control. Duffy, unsurprisingly, doesn't take this advice well, feeling ambushed and betrayed and immediately starts getting defensive, lashing out at his bandmates for not carrying their share of the weight. Back in Beantown, he gives a talk at Boston University to film students and once again gets completely combative and argumentative with them, making the whole experience awkward. I mean, look at the professor. I think his face says everything that needs to be said. The Brood's debut album would be released and had only sold 690 copies after six months post-launch. The abysmal numbers led to the band being dropped by Lava Slash Atlantic, and at this point, Duffy ghosted the band, not calling them back, which would lead to the group being dissolved for good, with the other bandmates going back to getting real-world jobs in LA. With nothing but the Boondock Saints left for Duffy, he would sign a deal with a small indie distributor, and the film would gear up for its release. But after the tragic events of Columbine in April of 99, Hollywood effectively shelve any films that glorified gun violence, which the Boondock Saints would not be exempt from. The film would eventually get a theatrical release, but with Duffy's reputation squandered and the timing being affected by a national tragedy, Boondock Saints would only release in five theaters for one week before being pulled. The film bombed and was panned by critics. Now, I could have ended things here on a, on a high note, on a happy ending where this egotistical auteur manages to rise to the top of Hollywood and flies too close to the sun like a, a drunken Irish Icarus, a Micarus, if you will. But I'm telling you now, this, my friends, will not be a happy ending for two reasons. I'll get into the first one here. The Boondock Saints is a steaming pile of Beantown trash. I heard this movie sucked, but I figured going into it is probably just um, these pretentious movie critics giving this movie a harsh rating because he was like an unsavory character in the Hollywood sphere. But that is not that this this movie deserves all the hate it got. I could see why this was very popular, specifically with a younger audience, because when when you're a kid, uh, you're much more easily blinded to these big, you know, uh, gory action scenes and kind of aren't really paying much attention to the plot. This movie appeals to the same type of person that would enjoy a, a Michael Bay action movie. It's just, it's, it's low tier microwave quality content. And the plot is like barely being held together. There's really just not much there. And the humor, which is like a huge backbone of this movie, is something a 12 year old would find funny. Honestly, this movie feels like it was written and directed by a drunk Irish bouncer with a drug problem, which, you know, I'm not gonna dive into the whole thing here because I could actually probably talk about this movie for like 20 minutes in and of itself, but I'll do like a little condensed review. I think maybe I'll actually probably do like a full review of this movie and its sequel uh, sometime in the near future, maybe next week. But the condensed version of my thoughts on this film is that, well, for starters, no joke. I, this isn't even like, I'm not even being hyperbolic here. This movie is like 20% slow motion and it never feels warranted. It's, um, I think it's pretty symbolic of the, the, the style of writing in this movie. It's just a bunch of stuff happening without any real rhyme or reason. The action set pieces are very loosely tied together by something resembling a plot, but if you had any moment were to stop and think about what just happened, even for a second, you'll immediately see the holes in logic left by the writer. He clearly tried to borrow the quippy black comedy style of writing from, let's say, a Quentin Tarantino film or a Guy Ritchie flick, but Duffy's dialogue is stiff and hollow, devoid of any semblance of humans interacting verbally. If Guy Ritchie or Tarantino's dialogue is human, then Duffy's is an almost life-size standee you'd see in a movie theater, a PNG printed out on cardboard that from a distance could be mistaken to be a person if you're nearsighted and half cocked. Duffy removes all the little bits and pieces that make those scripts interesting, and what you end up being left with is bad words equal funny, which again did actually help it sell to a younger viewership on the home market, but it does nothing for the film itself. The soundtrack is ass, 
It uses the same techno rave beats popularized by films like The Matrix or Blade, except they sound like they were produced by the meme of that girl DJing pretending to turn knobs. You also get a mix of hard rock hits. Because you know, rock and roll is badass, and so is all of this movie's characters, so it, it fits. Tossing aside artistic differences, my main gripe with the soundtrack is its overuse. I feel like every scene has some royalty-free sounding guitar riff or breakbeat blaring in your face, to the point I can't often understand what people are saying. It's just not well mixed. The less than stellar writing doesn't only apply to the plot and the dialogue, though. It also applies to the characters in and of themselves. Character motivations are basically non-existent, for example. The premise of the film is these two brothers get into a bar fight with some Russian gangsters and end up winning. The Russian mob then want get backs on them and attempt to assassinate them, but then by logic bending brute force, manage to kill the mobsters and not be charged with double homicide because it was self-defense. Then they get possessed by angels, seemingly who entrust them to start just murdering mobsters indiscriminately, removing any process of the criminal justice system. The characters instantly evolve from these two kind of dumb, happy-go-lucky, not a care in the world, hearts of gold puppy dogs into sociopath, ice-in-their-vein assassins. They then go on a bloodbath murder spree, killing the entirety of the Russian and Italian mob with very little resistance or intel, getting an FBI special agent who was addicted to solving crimes and gay guys to join the team and become trans to help them murder people in cold blood all whilst the legendary hitman who was hired to kill them turns out to be their father and also joins the team, a fact that happened so quickly that I actually ended up missing it during my watch through of the movie because I must have zoned out for an entire sentence of dialogue. The bar had been set so low at that point, I didn't even question that the main villain was now a good guy. Like I didn't, I was like, yeah, that, I guess that makes sense. It was only during my viewing of the sequel where their father was using the word sons a, a, like a lot. And I was like, wait, are they related? And then I had to go on Wikipedia and read through the plot of, of the first movie. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess they are father and sons. Okay. Editor feet here. I went back and watched the entire scene where we find out that Billy Connolly is in fact the father of the twins. And at no point does a single line of dialogue indicate that he is indeed the father. So this wasn't me uh, not paying attention because I have TikTok brain. No, this is, this is just poor writing once again. The moment you're supposed to realize that he is indeed the father is um, they start rehearsing this uh, Christian uh, what do you call it, like a Christian passage, a Christian prayer after they murder people. And he uh, also knows the same prayer. And I guess if you're not completely familiar with every single prayer in the Christian Bible, um, then you would know that this was a custom prayer. This wasn't one in the Bible. And the only way Billy Connolly's character would know it is that he is, of course, their father. That's how you were supposed to put that together. This is, this is not my fault, boys. The one thing this movie does nail is casting. Performances are super campy and over the top, cartoonish. This movie honestly would have worked better as like a comic book, but I digress. The overdramatic performances are the fault of the script and the director, but I thought the actual casting and the performances from the actors were spot on. Well, at least for the main cast. Everyone who isn't Norman Reedus, Sean Patrick Flannery, William Defoe, or Billy Connolly were seemingly hired off a Craigslist ad. I feel like for all the B-level and lower players, this is the first, and probably the last, acting gig of their careers. Every component of this movie sucks. Not unlike The Room by Tommy Wiseau, it's so bad, it's actually kind of good. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! If you're like four drinks deep, or often edible and you're with friends and want to laugh at like an unintentional comedy, I would actually recommend this movie. Anything outside of that context, it's this movie gets a zero out of three. In a Hail Mary last ditch attempt at relevancy, despite all of Duffy's flaws, Blockbuster would buy exclusive rights to the home video release, an unprecedented move at the time, and would give the film prime real estate in stores across the country. And the tactic? actually worked. The film did big numbers in the home market release, establishing itself as a cult classic. To the chagrin of the video rental empire, Blockbuster would rake in over $50 million from the rental and DVD market, having become a huge hit with a younger audience. Remember, this is in like the early days of the 2000s, so 
Uh, movie film ratings and ESRB ratings, especially for home releases, didn't really mean as much as they do now. Remember when I said this wouldn't be a happy ending? But I'm telling you now, this, my friends, will not be a happy ending for two reasons. I'll get into the first one here. Well, here's part two of that statement. Duffy's contract with the film studio did not include any back end on TV airings, home releases, AKA DVD sales, or international market rights. Through some miracle, Duffy's enormous ego, being blackballed in the film industry, his album flopping, his film flopping, this movie somehow still managed to find success despite it all. But Duffy? wouldn't see a dime. He was given a golden ticket, and even if he didn't cash it in on booze and pride, not the gay stuff, but like in a classical sense, he still ended up making a bad film that had a charm to it. In 2003, the documentary Overnight finally released, detailing the downfall of a Hollywood indie darling earmarked by Harvey Weinstein himself to be the next tastemaker. The release of this documentary would play some factor into the sales of the Boondock Saints during its home video run with Blockbuster. Duffy would later claim that he'd end up suing the film studio, where they'd settle out of court for an undisclosed percentage of the DVD sales, as well as giving him rights to create the film's sequel. After a year of production hell, the Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day, would finally release in 2009 to about the same exact reception as the first one. Honestly, in the over 10 years it took Duffy to make the two films, it seemed like he learned nothing at all. I could honestly say, having watched both films back to back, that the second one is substantially worse and that's, that's a lot to say because it's a, it set a pretty low standard. And that's it. Duffy wouldn't go on to make any other films, except I think he wrote for something with Pauly Shore maybe, but he wouldn't really see any other kind of success in Hollywood outside of the two Boondock Saints films. If you enjoyed the video, please consider supporting the channel and thank you for watching. Till next time.